Horror houses can be found at carnivals or during Halloween time. While they are made to scare those who enter, they are nonetheless simply meant to entertain. But there are real-life houses filled with terror all around the world, built by crime, abuse, and even murder by some of the most heinous criminals that have ever lived. These are the top four real and most sinister houses of terror. Number four, Darren Dion Van. In 2014, 19-year-old Afrika Hardy was found strangled and left inside a bathtub in a Motel 6. She left clues on her phone as to the identity of her killer, and they tracked down her perpetrator using those records, and this led them straight to Darren Dion Van. Born in Indiana in 1971, Darren Dion Van was once married to a woman 16 years his senior. They eventually divorced in 2009 after Van's multiple brush-ins with the law. He'd been in and out of jail, including serving five years for sexual assault in Texas, and was other than honorably discharged from the United States Marine Corps. The moment Darren was taken by police and questioned about his involvement in the death of Miss Hardy, he caved and admitted to the murder. Not only that, but to their surprise, he also admitted to killing six other women and told police he would lead them to every single one of the bodies in return for a lighter sentence. Van's victims were mostly prostitutes. He would hire them through an escort service and use the moniker Big Boy Appetite. Once he met with the women, he would beat them up and then torture them. Once satisfied, he would kill them, and his method of disposal was to leave their dead bodies in abandoned houses and buildings all across Gary, Indiana. Aside from Hardy, his other victims included 35-year-old Aneith Jones. Van told detectives that a mutual friend paid him $500 to make Jones disappear. Van called her several times before meeting her at a house and admitted to having sex with her before strangling her to death. Two other women, Tiara Beatty and Christine Williams, were found in another abandoned house, while another two women were found partially skeletonized on the same property where Jones was arrested, but inside a different home. Meanwhile, another victim was located in another abandoned house, and because the last three bodies were so badly decomposed, they still remain unidentified. Currently, Darren remains incarcerated while awaiting his trial for the murders of Hardy and Jones. When asked why he did it, he explained that he killed the women because of his resentment over serving prison time in Texas for assaulting a prostitute, something he felt he didn't deserve. Number three, the Sultan's Palace, Gardet Le Prete House. Sitting prominently in the French Quarter of New Orleans, a beautifully aged building with pale pink walls and iron details sits quietly. Formerly owned by plantation owner Jean Baptiste Le Pret in 1836, the huge mansion was sold after he and his business fell on hard times. Because it was so expensive, he had trouble finding a buyer until one day a mysterious Arab offered to purchase it. After the finances were sorted, the new owner began to move in. Little was known about this man as he kept mostly to himself. In turn, plenty of rumors began circulating, including one that said he was a Turkish sultan. The first things the neighbors noticed were the preparations prior to the owner moving in. A fence and gate were added and the windows were installed with heavy draperies and locks. The balconies were permanently closed and large trunks as well as young women, boys and servants started coming in. The noise, music and parties would last all day and all night. There was rarely a time when the neighborhood couldn't hear sounds from the home, which came to be known as the Sultan's Palace. However, one early morning a woman was walking past the house when she noticed something odd. The place was eerily silent. She approached the gate and noticed it was partially open, and then on the steps of the front door, a pool of blood was dripping, coming from the inside. Horrified, she rushed to the police, and when they came and opened the front door, they were shocked at what they saw. There was not a single inch of the house that wasn't covered in blood. Corpses of men, women, and children were everywhere. Their bodies hacked into so many pieces it was difficult to determine just how many victims there were. Upon examination, all of the women and young boys had been sexually assaulted. This included the guards the Sultan brought with him. They too were raped before violently being hacked to pieces. 
As for the sultan, his body was found in the courtyard, his hands sticking out from the ground. Apparently he had been buried alive while his lungs and throat were filled with dirt. As it turns out, the sultan was actually not a sultan at all, but the brother of one. He had fled his home country, stealing his brother's harem and possessions. Many speculate that it was his brother that sent assassins to kill him and murder everyone inside. Meanwhile, others believe pirates whom the sultan had dealings with attacked the home. The house still stands today, and whatever the truth may be, there's no doubt that the sultan's palace at the French Quarter was a home filled with unspeakable horrors. Number 2. John Wayne Gacy's Crawl Space Dubbed as the Killer Clown, there's hardly any person in America that hasn't heard of Gacy's notorious crimes. John Wayne Gacy was known to his neighbors, friends, and family as a charming, hard-working, and responsible man, but he was hiding a deep and very dark secret. Gacy suffered from a troubled childhood, growing up with an abusive, alcoholic father. In August of 1967, when he was 25 years old, he lured 15-year-old Donald Voorhees to his home, gave him alcohol, and convinced the young man to perform sexual acts on him. He went on to lure other young teenage boys this way, sometimes even paying them up to $50 each. But Voorhees reported the incident to his father, who subsequently told the police. Even though he fought the allegations, Gacy eventually pled guilty to one count of sodomy, and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. The same day he was indicted, his wife filed for divorce with alimony in full custody of their children. He would never see them again. Gacy was put on probation and let out early for good behavior. There were two conditions to his parole. He was to move back to Chicago and observe a 10 p.m. curfew. But soon after he moved, he was arrested again for sexual assault of a young boy he picked up at a nearby Greyhound terminal. The charges were dropped, however, because the youth never showed up for court. He soon remarried and had two daughters. His life at this time was perfect looking on the outside. He was happily married, had a successful business, and even managed to meet the first lady, Rosalind Carter. It was also at this time when he started to wear a clown costume and perform at parties, hospitals, and charitable events. He taught himself how to paint his makeup, but professional clowns noted that Gacy painted his face with sharp corners instead of rounded ones, which were more ideal as to not scare the children. By 1975, Gacy admitted to his wife he was bisexual, and this led to their divorce. After that, Gacy increased the frequency of what he called cruising, when he would pick up teenage boys, bring them home, and rape them. He selected most of his victims right from his employee pool because his business conveniently employed a lot of high school students and youths. His first attempt was to abduct and rape 15-year-old Anthony Antonucci. Gacy visited him at home because he had injured his leg, then got him drunk, wrestled him to the floor, and placed handcuffs on him. Anthony retaliated, fighting to obtain the keys and actually managed to place the handcuffs on Gacy and then threatened to call the police. Gacy promised to leave if the handcuffs would be removed, so Anthony agreed and the killer clown left. A week later, another employee from PDM, which was Gacy's business, disappeared. Gacy would become more active in his abductions, and they could happen days or even just hours apart. His M.O. would be to lure the boys to his home or simply take them off the street. He would stuff their mouth with cloth or their own underwear to keep them quiet, and then rape and torture them before killing them by wrapping a tourniquet around their throat. This is what Gacy called his rope trick. He would bury his victims right in his home, sometimes placing their bodies under his bed for a day or two before moving them down to the crawl space. When police finally arrested him, they discovered a total of 26 bodies buried under his house. Other victims were stuffed in his garage and dining area. When he finally ran out of space in his home for the bodies, he opted to throw them in the De Plains River. He admits to doing this to five victims, but many speculate there were many more. Gacy was finally arrested after he broke down suffering pressure from cop surveillance. A warrant was issued for his home for illegal possession of marijuana because they didn't have solid evidence about his crimes. In the end, he was charged with 33 counts of murder, the most of any serial killer charged in the U.S. 
John Wayne Gacy was found guilty on all accounts and died via lethal injection on May 9, 1994. Number 1. H. H. Holmes' Murder Castle Most of you may not know who H. H. Holmes is. Over time, his name has been lost in history, but his murderous crimes and his infamous murder castle have lived on in infamy. H. H. Holmes was a con artist, bigamist, and the first modern-day serial killer in every sense of the word. He constructed his famous murder castle, a hotel he deliberately created to trap and kill his victims. When Holmes arrived in Chicago in 1886, he began working as a pharmacist and started building his famous hotel. It was dubbed the World's Fair Hotel because it was close to the site of the World's Fair and designed to house various attendees. The bottom portion was a commercial space where Holmes ran his pharmacy, selling magical water that could cure any sickness. During the construction of the hotel, Holmes would repeatedly hire and then subsequently fire contractors. He stated that they were doing a dismal job, but he was really just making sure that no one caught on to his plan. By the end of it, the hotel measured 150 feet long and 50 feet wide. It contained nearly 100 rooms filled with hinged walls, fake partitions, stairways that led to nowhere, and doors fitted with locks that would seal a person inside. The hotel was rigged with a clever alarm system so Holmes knew if someone was moving around. All of the bedrooms were soundproof to ensure no one knew what was happening within. What's more horrifying is that he also built a fully functional gas chamber, as well as a room strictly reserved for hanging people. To dispose of the bodies, a special chute was prepared that would lead downstairs where Holmes would cut up, dissect, and even sell the remains to the medical community. To help with the disposal, giant furnaces and lime pits along with acid baths were also constructed. Inside this maze of terror, Holmes would kill guests, mostly women, attending the World's Fair. He would hire these women as stenographers to notarize his shady paperwork before disposing of them once he felt their purpose had been used. At the end of the World's Fair, Holmes left Chicago and his castle behind. By this time, he was caught up in an insurance scheme involving his accomplice, Benjamin Pitzel. Although Benjamin was initially part of the scheme involving one of the victims in Murder Castle, Holmes ended up killing him and collecting on the $10,000 insurance payout. He also killed three of Benjamin's young children. The two girls he locked up in a trunk and fed a gas line hose where they died of asphyxiation. As for the little boy Howard, his remains were found burned in a chimney. When Holmes was finally arrested and the secrets of his murder castle uncovered, he was connected to a total of nine murders, but many people believe he could have killed as many as 20 to 200 throughout his life. H.H. H. Holmes was sentenced to die on May 7, 1896. When he was hanged, his neck didn't snap like most criminals. Instead, he died a slow, agonizing death in the gallows. Oddly enough, he had one last request prior to his death. Despite his panache for dissecting people, he asked his body be buried 10 feet deep into the ground and sealed in concrete to prevent grave robbers from dissecting his corpse. Those were the top four real and most sinister houses of terror. Horror houses are reserved for fun scares and making people jump, but many of them pull inspiration from these real life homes where some of the most twisted killers you could ever imagine lived places you'd certainly never want to go into yourself. If you liked watching this video, then please subscribe to our channel, and each week we'll bring you a new scary mystery to enjoy. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.